What's up, guys, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Neo Vintage Podcast. I'm Jerome, and I'm here with... Steve, hope everyone's doing well out there. And for you guys who have never seen the show before, we're just two guys that like to talk over the biggest stories in gaming, but we always like to start with what we've been playing. So, Steve, what you been playing? Yeah, uh, to no surprise, I haven't been playing too much. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we've... Not that I've given up on, but just was never trucking through anymore. Um, Saints Row is pretty much... I put <laughs> Saints that, Row. Uh, I must, uh, next time I turn my PlayStation on, PlayStation, I will probably uninstall it just because it's not even calling back to me now. <laughs> like, there's, there's, I don't want to play it. Um, so I've been kind of just kind of waiting for the new stuff to drop. Uh, obviously, we're in this small waiting grace period. Um, it actually ends, I think, this week uh, that we just looked up. Um, so I've just been playing a lot of the comfort food stuff. Uh, still playing a little bit of Cyberpunk, mainly on my Steam Deck. Um, just re- still really enjoying that game. Works significantly obviously significantly better than it ever has even on steam deck with its you know compromises um but it's yeah it's still really interesting trying to play it differently without you know going into the same route that i did before trying to be a little bit more of a jerk in certain senses to one kind of fast pace some decisions you know instead of doing three missions to get my answer i can just beat the guy up and get my answers <laughs> um so just trying it a little different so still solid really glad that games you know got that revision and it, it has a future now uh, especially with uh cd project red showing what like the next 100 years of their content that's, that's going to be coming um so it's gonna be pretty interesting um but the main thing I've been playing, and because um, I've been playing too too much, uh, I, I've been playing a lot of this. Though. <laughs> Surprise! I've been playing a whole bunch of Vampire Survivors. I um, like that. S- still, still, just loving this game. Uh, I finally started. I did look up a small, not guide, but a small sort of t- tips on how to unlock certain things. So, because I was like, man, I haven't gotten a new character in a while, um, and it's all these little things. It's, it's not like it's a, no cheating. It's just like, hey, make sure you get your get this item up to level seven you'll unlock the ability to purchase a character and uh small small little details like that so i finally got in i think i'm down above 10 characters i want to say i'm in almost maybe almost 20 characters i think i have um from varieties you know from a weird old man that shoots the carts um to oh the cartwheels yeah 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 there's the ghost that i don't remember what the ghost does but i remember i did not like it um, you know, to having I think Poe, the old gentleman that starts with garlic, which is really really good because that's one of the best ones to start with is getting garlic because well as you know you just start cleaning house through some of these mobs um, to get that level up really quickly. Um, still trying to work my way to get that fourth stage, which to do that you need to you get I think level sixty in the previous stage, and once like it it gets rough, you know, once you get into the forties, it's you gotta use your 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 movement. If uh, at that point, I'm not really worried about attacking because at that point, I've got just waves of stuff just killing. But it's trying to get the experience at the same time. Um, so I'm putting that work in. I, I like it. I, I do have to purchase a few characters because you know that's always been my small sort of eye roaming is like you unlock the character to buy and then you gotta drop like two thousand coin uh, to get each character, uh, especially later on. Two thousand, just wait, just wait. Yeah, just wait. <laughs> yeah so it's just like it gets oof. pricier. Yeah, it gets yeah. Right now I'm at I think to purchase the two characters I need I could get I think like twenty five hundred each. Gotcha. Um, and uh, and it's not not impossible to get money, but you don't gain money that easy <laughs> um, in the game. But I'm super excited for this. I know they're working on that big. Uh, you know out of beta moment um i don't know what the game's gonna raise its price to but i i, I know it's sometime this month i believe we're getting the i don't even know what to call it the full it's the full release sort of expansion sort of uh stuff so i'm curious to see what's in there so obviously still playing that I even did that on pc uh, lately so it's Good to have that all that real estate it's just really good i'm so excited for this game i, I it's 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 gonna be a rough one not putting this game up in like my game of the year like high up there because the amount of times i've played it and it counts in both ways because the full release technically is until a couple weeks now so it will be a 2022 game so it'll be in the conversation for sure i think in our halfway mark of the year we talked about it and it was up there for both of us um 
best three dollars or whatever it was I've spent in a long long time so it's gonna be really exciting um so yeah that's all I've really been up to I, I haven't been playing a little more I'm trying to clean house on a few things um I've been cleaning uh, and I'm kind of in a dilemma I've been trying to finish off Bayonetta 2 uh, oh, to prep for Bayonetta yeah. 3 uh so we'll obviously have a small discussion <laughs> on if that's gonna happen um but yeah that's all I've been up to what have uh what you been playing yeah, so I guess I'll just piggyback off of you. Um, I've also played Vampire Survivor, but I've actually kind of stopped. Not because I, I uh, dislike the game. Obviously, I love the game. I kind of maxed it, kind of. Um, I've unlocked all five major stages. I've killed death. I've, um, Which is not like a, a narrative spoiler. There's just a way that you can do that if you get powerful enough in a run. Um I've gotten, I think, four or five of the bonus stages. I've done the hyper mode. I've done, I have, you know, most of the characters that I can find using the guides. There's every once in a while little ones that they talk about that I, I find. I'm like, oh, I can unlock that and I'll, I'll unlock that. They have all the upgrades. I maxed out my upgrades. Um, and so I'm kind of like just here now where it's like I, I i can do runs and everything like that but like i'm not building towards anything there's nothing really to build towards uh currently where you know like you go to a stage and it's like okay if i survive to the 25 minute mark it's going to spawn this boss if i kill that boss then i'll be able to unlock this i, I don't have any more of those things i did all of them um so for right now i kind of have to wait on the update to just have content to do um so yeah, I love Vampire Survivor, but I've just like maxed it out. I just played it too much. I think I just, okay. I just put too much time in, and I, it's not that I'm like so good at it. I think it's one of those games that once you just figure out like a good strat and like you have a character that works for you, um, it, it it kind of compounds against previous runs where like you figure out something and you make it a little longer, and then you're like, oh wow, that was a thirty minute run, uh, and that worked really well, and then you do that for the next one, and then next thing you know, you kind of find yourself where it's like, oh, you haven't had a run that you've hit less than level seventy in like a while. Like I haven't had a run that I've hit less than level seventy, like I don't know on how long. Um, so yeah, no, it, it, it's pretty cool i just need to wait on some more content because i can't really do anything i found some cool characters that work for me uh some of the late game characters are like really really dope um where it kind of makes me remember yeah going back to the old man poe like if you pulled him out and during some of these like you'd be dead in like minutes like <laughs> like some of these places um where the garlic doesn't really cut it but they have some really other cool moves there's this one lady who has like basically a pillar of energy that she launches upwards and downwards and you can you can expand the the scope and size of that one that one's pretty cool um she's become my main yeah yeah she's really good i actually have a dog that spawns flowers around him that one's a really trippy one to use um i have there's a lot of weird characters in this game um but yeah no i'm having a blast with it and i guess that can bring me to my second game which i'm actually in a very similar place in which is also cyberpunk um they had an update and they added a couple things to it uh, i'm still working off of my old save i've never really restarted the story so i've literally just kind of been doing whatever new things they add the gigs buying whatever if there's a new car i buy the new car i have all the apartments uh, and I just do everything until I don't have anything to do again, and then I put it down, and then I just wait for some more content. And so I basically just did that again. I maybe got an hour and change out of it, uh, of some of the new content. They had a couple of new gigs that was exciting to kind of get back in. I was super sloppy when I started playing because I completely forgot how to play that game. Um, but uh, I, I got back into the swing of things, and I had, I had a good time with it. Uh, basically, I can pretty say confidently that that game right now in 2022 is basically what it should have been once upon a time. Um, yeah, for anybody starting it now, I think their experience is going to be, especially on the new new consoles. I can't speak to the PS4, th uh, the Xbox One version. I don't know anything about that. Uh, but if you're playing on PS5 or Series X, I think the experience now is pretty pretty stable in, in my opinion like i played uh for maybe three hours since all this new updates came out and i haven't crashed once which is crazy by cyberpunk standards um so yeah no it's super stable it looks good no crazy frame tearing when i'm in jittery and just random stuff that was happening i haven't really seen too much random t posing uh every once in a while the npc's animations are still not the greatest i feel like that's just kind of the game at this point um mm -hmm. But overall, no, it runs really well, and I was able to have a really good time um, getting back into that world because the world is great. It's just 
at once upon a time it was just pretty content like there are still some things that i think that there are opportunities for them to explore a little bit more um I think we're all still kind of waiting on that larger story expansion. There was supposed to be two. I think we're only going to get one now uh, for this version of Cyberpunk 2077. Um, but overall, <clears throat> I, I'm really happy with the shape of it right now. Uh, as I mentioned on the last podcast, uh, I was finishing up Last of Us 1, and then I jumped into Last of Us 2, and I finished that as well. Had a blast with it. I honestly had more fun with it this time than the first time I played it. Um, and, and the main reason for that is like, it's a very intense game. So like, if you don't know where it's going, it kind of has you on the edge of your seat, especially that late game stuff. Uh, but this time I knew where it was going. So I kind of just had the chance to kind of explore and play around with things and get as many of the collectibles as possible. And then the new game plus version is really cool. Cause you can go in with your, all your upgraded weaponry, or you can uh, do what I do, which is just the encounters. And they have all these different extra things that you can modify the gameplay with. So like one shot death or infinite crafting or infinite ammo. So you can just choose fun encounters and go crazy. And so I'll like plant all these, like uh, the, the motion bombs, I forget what they're called, but I like plant them all over the place and go crazy. And no, I'm just having a blast with it. So last of us part two, big, big fan. It's really awesome to be able to play the both, both games kind of back to back. And, uh, once upon a time, you know, you were playing, you could play them back to back, but you were playing effect effectively like a very early PS4 game. And then, you know, the tail end of PS4 game, early PS5 game. Um, and so the experiences were a little bit more divergent. One story was really strong. One gameplay was very strong. And then they kind of like lack, not lacked, but they shined in opposite places almost. Where this time, when you play them back to back, and the gameplay is so similar between the two, other than maybe the dodge mechanic, I think is like the big thing that I think is the difference between one and two at this point. I think it's just really an awesome experience to kind of go back to back and, um, you know, we don't need to retalk Last of Us Part Two, but yeah, I'm just, <clears throat> I, I, I really do hold that. I don't think the story is as far behind one as some people do, but that's just me. Um, really quick, I also, for a while, have wanted to play this game, and then finally it came to Game Pass, Chivalry 2. Um, mm. I didn't want to buy this game just because I knew the gameplay style is not really my cup of tea, so I probably wouldn't be able to get the most time out of it. So I was hoping to pay as little as possible, and then finally it came on Game Pass. And for you guys that don't know, it's basically like a third or first person uh, medieval knight war simulator, kind of, uh, where they give you, you know, you're maybe you're you're trying to storm a castle or whatever, and then you just fight and then die and respawn and do things um and it, it's really really fun i am so bad at it like i have trouble i mean i'm able to kill people but it's it's mostly in the bot matches but the moment i go into like live stuff I'm, I'm terrible uh but no i'm having a really really good time with it i'm probably not gonna play too too much more of it because again it's multiplayer not really my thing um but yeah it's really really fun so if if you're looking for something to play with some friends maybe and just mess around with chivalry 2 is a good time and then lastly is a game that i have been waiting for for quite a while uh since i first saw it uh kind of teased and then finally now it's out moon scars also on game pass mm -hmm. uh it's an amazing metroidvania for you guys that don't know uh for you who play a lot of metroidvanias i think it's most similar to imagine like dead cells meets blasphemous it's like somewhere in between there um amazing pixel art really dark kind of brooding ambiance very similar to blasphemy in that way um and and just overall i'm having a really good time with it uh it, it has a great parry system i'm very very early on it so i can't speak too too much about it but other than that i would say that i'm enjoying it quite a bit if you like metroidvanias i think you'll like this one i don't the narrative's a little um abstract at times i don't 100 percent know what's going on in that game at any given moment uh but i think overall moon scars is really solid so if you have an xbox definitely get it on game pass if you don't it's on everything else uh, i don't think it's that expensive i think it's 20 25 something like that it's in my wish list on steam yeah it's between 20 and 25 not that bad uh but yeah much worth the money especially if you like metroidvanias if you don't like super difficult metroidvanias this might not be for you uh in terms of difficulty i would say this is on the kind of like 
high to middle difficulty it's like not as hard as some of these games get but it's certainly not one of the more accessible ones just because it's so reliant on that parry system so if you don't get comfortable with a little bit of the enemy timing um then you're going to be in rough shape but the good thing is this does have very strong visual cues on when they're going to attack so i find the parry system of this game to be as uh pretty much on par with what you'd find in like a metroid uh, with Metroid Samus Returns or Metroid uh, Dread where there's a visual cue and then you know when to parry it's very similar type situation so uh, it's not the first Metroidvania to have a parry system it's not the first one to have a visual cue on it uh, so you know if you're if you're familiar with those if you're comfortable with those I think you'll be able to jump at the moon scars and have pretty much a good time without any significant difficulty the platforming hasn't been all that difficult in my opinion it, it's mostly i think just uh getting that enemy timing down i think is where most of the challenge lies early in the game i can't speak to later um but yeah that's everything i've been playing yeah, those are uh, both two games that i've been wanting to try out actually um moon scars obviously and uh, chivalry I, I did lightly uh play there was a the time steam had an open weekend or something like that and gotcha. i tried it and it was fun i was like okay it's sort of it's weird it's sort of more casual for honor but at the same time with way more hardcore mechanics um but i thought it was pretty interesting and moon scars yeah right up my alley i just haven't um pulled the trigger on um well now i don't have to get it because it is on game pass so i am looking forward to that as well um but yeah let's get right into the stories the first one is uh one we were kind of just waiting for. I think this is yeah. what we knew we would be talking about one day. So we can get it uh, right into it. Uh, so Google has announced it is winding down its Stadia video game streaming service and will shut it down on January 18th, 2023. In a new blog, the search engine company revealed that Stadia, quote, hasn't gained the traction with users that we expected. And as a result, the company has made the difficult decision to begin winding down the service. Google will be refunding users who purchase either hardware or games for Google and Stadia. We're grateful to the dedicated Stadia players that have been with us from the start. We will be refunding all Stadia hardware purchases made through the Google Store and all game and add-on content purchases made through the Stadia Store. Uh, players will still be able to access their game library and play until January 18th. So yeah, this is something we kind of knew was going to happen. You know, we, we've seen the signs. We, we kind of foretold it from the beginning um, that this was not launching the way it was it wasn't being it's the service wasn't what it needed to be it was a step in the right direction but a very very tiny step um and it, it is unfortunate because from sometimes the, the few times i used it and very little uh it was interesting to see it work <laughs> in moments but uh, besides that the just the the entryway was just too much you know from the repurchasing video games at full price to not truly own them and this proves that because uh if this was uh if Mortal Kombat 11 this is the only way you owned it for some reason now you do get a refund um it's kind of tooth and nail because I believe you get a refund as Google like credit on your Google account uh, I'm not sure how that exactly all works um from what I saw that's what I understood and have been seeing um but it's, it is a little unfortunate but this shows what happens when one you don't truly believe in the product i think google early on we saw them kind of give up on it you know they launched with a few exclusives and quickly those exclusives uh were ported over to the main consoles there are a few games unfortunately sort of stuck on here and they do not have the publishing rights and there's a lot of uh, you know legal issues and technical issues that they can't even port their games um, so that's very unfortunate and I hope that does work out for the, some of these companies um, I do remember there was a horror game that launched with Google Stadia that was okay you know pretty well received but I believe that's going to be stranded on there unfortunately so there's a lot of little things that unfortunately hopefully get worked out though but in a world that we have Xbox uh, game pass uh, you know xcloud working for essentially free with your game pass membership um it just didn't make sense that google stadia was trying to be this sort of premiere aspect of it and it just never made sense to me so rest in peace stadia uh, i'm glad and google obviously has the money to do it that they aren't just sort of locking everybody out of their content uh, they're like hey you can still access it until this date and once that date comes 
uh, I guess you have to put in for a refund or whatever. It's not an auto refund. Um, so anyone who has that stuff, uh, start looking into that. Um, but it's a bold move for them to be straight up refunding that. Uh, that's something they didn't have to do. They would have gotten backlash, but um, good on them for, for sticking through it. But uh, how did you uh, respond to this? Yeah, <clears throat> it's one of those things that if anybody who's kind of been watching the game industry to any degree, uh, it's a matter of kind of uh, if not when, you know what I mean? Like, uh, or, or when, not if. Um, it, we all knew it was going to fail. It, it's one of those things where I don't... Thankfully, they were never really the industry leaders, even in the streaming front. Um, they it was, it was them and then two others. You know, you have Luna doing its thing on the side there that kind of has the monster of Amazon behind it. So I think that's kind of firmly supplanted uh, there. And then you have xCloud, which is has the added benefit of taking an existing user base and charging them nothing to be like, hey, try it out. And and that is the cool thing. There's no barrier to entry there. And uh, for those who already have the, the hardware and are already in that ecosystem. Uh, so Stadia was starting fresh, you know what I mean? Like a, there, was no, there was no pre-existing uh ecosystem they had to pull from there was no google gamers out there uh to any real degree so they had to recruit and kind of poach new people uh and introduce them to this world and and the shame is yeah the tech was solid you know it had significant difficulties up front and that was not great i think that killed a little bit of their momentum up front but they were able to get it together and eventually you know i've tried all three uh streaming gaming streaming platforms to, to varying amounts, uh, the one that I played the most of is is probably Stadia, to be honest with you. Um, and, and, I, and I tried them all out. And yeah, it, it, I think the big problem with Stadia was not its streaming tech. It was the model in general, the way that they, they kind of rolled it out. The difference was I had an Xbox, so I jumped into xCloud and I had dozens of games to choose from. Uh, I jumped into Luna, had a subscription, and there was a whole list of games very akin to a Game Pass being like, here, choose one. And so I chose a couple to play, and I was able to play them. But then when I got Stadia, it was a little different where they had, you know, a handful of games I could play, but then everything else, it was like an open storefront for you to buy. And it's like, here, you you either play Destiny 2 or you buy something else. And it's like, it's just a tough sell because... um, the way where we are right now, I think in 2022, and I think ideally the they want to get to a point where people who maybe don't have all the gaming tech, they're like, oh, I don't have to buy anything. I just need to subscribe to the service. Oh, yeah, sure. And then they jump in and they're able to play on their laptop or their phone or whatever. Um, and that, I think, is where they're trying to go. But as of right now, much like VR, um, streaming is pretty much limited to those who have a decent interest in gaming already, who are already kind of in that ecosystem, already paying attention. And it's like, oh, I'm willing to give this a shot. Because, again, you need very, very consistent, strong internet connections uh, to do this. It's not just your average consumer, maybe, who doesn't have fiber optic connection, you know what I mean? Um, So the people who are kind of paying attention, I feel like, are already kind of invested in the ecosystem to some degree. And having basically saying like, hey, you need to repurchase all your games over and over again to experience them on Stadia Tech kind of goes against the purpose of even trying to play Stadia in the first place, which was like not this massive barrier to entry. And I think they they overcame the hardware barrier to entry and instead pawned the software barrier on everybody. And it's like, okay, you don't have to buy a whole bunch of hardware, but yeah, but I have to buy every piece of software on here. Um, re over again, and and I think that was wrong. I think it should have been kind of a subscription service where uh, you have access to eighty, a hundred games, maybe paid exclusives. Like, hey, this is only on Stadia. You get you pay twenty bucks, you'll have access to this or whatever. I don't I don't know, but I think yeah, they they just messed up on kind of the economic model of laying it out. But that's why I bought. I have a Stadia. That's why I bought it because I knew this was not long for its world, and I think the biggest barrier stadia had going for it was was google to be honest with you um if any other company had launched with this i probably would have had a little bit more faith about it and it's not that google is incompetent but so much as they just don't seem to have a lot of faith in their own products they just abandon everything and so that was what we said when they first announced this and they were first rolling it out which was like this is not going to last long because google doesn't let anything last long 
they're not willing to stick around and really take the L and operate on a loss and do all the things it takes to really get going. Because you got to think, like, whose entrance into the game industry was easy? No one's really. You know, Sega stumbled for a minute before they were able to get some real traction with the Genesis, and then they stumbled afterwards. PlayStation, the PS1, it was a hit, but it didn't really get into their bag until PS2. Same thing with Xbox. Didn't get into their bag until 360. Nintendo, I mean, look how long around they were around before things really, really caught on. So even the, the, the industry leaders, it wasn't easy. You have to stick around. You have to try things out. Things are going to fail. But Google doesn't have a penchant to do that. They throw everything at this one piece of tech. They let you know, this is it. This is going to be the revolutionary thing. Oh, uh, it didn't work out. All right, scrap the whole thing. Yeah, like where's Google Glass at? It's the same concept. Um, and so that's, I think, the unfortunate biggest obstacle was that it was great tech and bad hands. And uh, it's a shame because I saw a lot of developers really care about it. They put together a really cool internal development team that didn't last long. I don't know if they output anything, um, but they looked like they were really passionate about it. And it's a shame that that didn't play out. But from what um, we heard Stadia say, they're, they're looking in the right direction now, which is basically letting other people borrow this tech which I think is going to be great for the the ecosystem in general. Um, Xbox, I don't think, necessarily needs the help, especially because, from what I understand, they're partnered with Sony on that. So they're, they're fine on that regard. Amazon's got its own thing. But I'm sure there's going to be lots of companies that would more than be willing to use the streaming tech for all different types of reasons. Who knows? Maybe they'll partner with Netflix or something like that because they have their own little thing there too. Um, but yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity for this tech in the future. I think streaming gaming will be... A, a force one day uh n not yet you know i think we're still many years off from that being in any way even close to a, a majority not even the majority of people playing that way uh but i think eventually as th i think the world in general moves against move away from like dedicated media hardware uh yeah it, it makes sense that eventually gaming will be there as well so long as there's that they fix the real latency issues but uh yeah, not surprised, not disappointed particularly because I don't think they offered too much. Uh, but, I, you know, I wish them the best. Yeah, but like we were saying, it is unfortunate to see it go. And I think, so as well, I think Google was just a little too ahead of itself. And I think Google wasn't taking cues from the market. Uh, you know, that the big thing that most of these, like you were saying, most of these streaming servers have is a really, really solid catalog, especially Microsoft's catalog. Um, and same with, so far with Luna, which I, I've tried Luna, and a big thing of Luna is that right now, you know, I think, I don't know if it's, I don't remember exactly their pricing model, but a lot of it was like, it's already in your Amazon Prime. Like when I go into yep. my Prime gaming to redeem my free games and free add-on, it's like, hey, play these games for free right now, no, no issue. And that's way more appealing than, hey, buy this software and or you know this hardware because there's there is a dongle right that you had to get for that um for some for if you wanted to play it on your tv yeah it's and just a fire stick um a there's fire not stick, like a right? luna stick or anything no okay, it, it's okay. pretty much all existing amazon hardware yeah yeah um so and that's way more appealing than like what google was doing which is like hey get this bundle and yeah play destiny 2 these other games that you're never gonna play or here, repurchase Mortal Kombat. And I keep using Mortal Kombat because I, I know that was on there. <laughs> I don't know what else was on there. Here's Mortal Kombat t almost two years after it launched uh, for about $50, $40. Yeah, Whatever tweaking. it was. I, when you can get that game secondhand for what, 20 digitally you can get the Ultimate Edition. For I've 30. seen it uh, less than 15 before. Exactly. Even even with all the DLC and stuff, you can get it for under thirty new digitally. So it's just it's it's just it wasn't a good option. Is where I think it was lacking. I said you, there was no reason to do this one over various various um, competition. Um, but we will. I don't think we'll ever see stage again because that name is now tainted. Uh, I do feel bad for anyone's. I was watching. Uh, financial guy discussed it where he was saying you know it's hard because some of these games lived and died and will die on stadia for the ones who can't get their stuff ported or work it out uh there'll be no proof on the resume um so it's it is unfortunate and my heart goes out to those people who really tried and 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 but i just wish you guys would have abandoned ship when uh 
when you have all the heads jumping off, uh, you know, these people who quickly, quickly, uh, you know, industry, you know, veterans quickly leaving Stadia, that should have been your sign uh, to definitely look elsewhere. But it is unfortunate, and I, I feel, I feel, I do feel for them. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a shame, and then I think it's kind of like a testament to the ability for a company's uh, – ability to kind of like dynamically assess a situation and respond fast and they did not uh and the result of that is the only response they had eventually was to shut the whole thing down because yeah. you know it's like too little too too late uh so i guess that's you know a lesson to everybody else that you know if if the customers are screaming one thing to you maybe listen and respond as fast as possible if possible uh to save your platform uh, but speaking of streaming, that brings us into our next story, and it's uh, another company that is in the streaming space, but doing a little bit better. Uh, and this is about the Xbox, Xbox streaming stick rumors. So it's confirmed hardware, but uh, the it, the how it's going to ultimately look, there's a lot of rumors around it. And, and uh, so this is what we got. So Microsoft's head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, has revealed the company's dedicated Xbox streaming device. Spen uh, Phil Spencer published a photo of the device on Twitter where you can see it sitting on top of your shelf in the Microsoft Office play space. It's a small white box that resembles the uh, look of the Xbox Series S and will be dedicated to accessing uh, Xbox games over the company's Xbox Cloud Gaming service. So it looks a lot like the Series S. It's kind of just a small white box, just a little bit smaller uh, than the Series S, if, 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 you know, as small as the Series S is. Um, Microsoft first announced that it was planning an Xbox streaming device last year, and many had incorrectly assumed that it would be a stick that would plug directly into the HDMI port, akin to like a Fire TV stick. Um, while Microsoft is still working on this Xbox streaming console codenamed Keystone, it will be more of a box or puck-like device that attaches to monitors and TVs. The Xbox streaming device will also likely include media apps like Netflix and lightweight user interface to launch Xbox games. Microsoft acknowledged the Keystone name earlier this year, but revealed it's working on a new version of the device. Sources familiar with Microsoft plans tell The Verge the Xbox team continues to work on its streaming device and plans to bring it to the market. And uh, this story is by Tom Warren uh, over at The Verge. So, yeah, very interesting stuff. So we basically know that a streaming device is coming. It's just how it's going to specifically look, when it's going to roll out. Um, but, yeah, chances are this is going to be a device, no disk drive, uh, will connect to the Xbox Cloud servers and allow you to play Xbox Cloud directly to a TV in place of a console i think it's an interesting thing um i probably won't get it just because again i have the xboxes uh and i, I have devices that i've accessed xcloud to before that worked fine i don't think i need a dedicated uh, streaming gaming device to be honest unless there's a significant advantage to having this device to be honest if there's some tech in it that says like you know with a decent connection like this is the most the best way for you to stream games that it, it it completely it somehow counteracts the latency or something like that uh so like you can stream you can stream games on anything you could do it on your phone your laptop or whatever but if you stream it through this device this is the only way to i don't know stream 4k or or whatever something like that you know then i think the it makes a little bit more sense that maybe i'll take a look at it do you have any interest in this device what do you think you know it's i think it's cool technology i think it's definitely a way to get xbox even more mainstream uh yeah. to sort of abandon the look of hardware and all that all that fun stuff um but to me it obviously does not speak uh because i really only stream i would really only <clears throat> i think most people only really play in one room so i really only play xbox in my living room um if i really wanted to like i could stream on my series x if there was a game I like when i want to try a game i have just first thing i hardwire my xbox and then and then i stream if i want to try a game out really quick to see if it's any good or what have you um I, I guess in a world where you had multiple rooms you could constantly be in and sometimes you want to just quickly pick it up and you have that good enough uh wi-fi i i guess it would work um to an extent but the few times where i've been in my bedroom maybe watching a movie and i wanted to play something else um before steam deck uh i do have a little clip i can put on my xbox control and i just xbox game i i cloud stream to my phone um even on ios it's not an issue so it, it is slightly weird but it's like I, I think of the people who aren't 
caught up to it and aren't on that or haven't really dove into cloud you know xbox x cloud gaming xbox cloud gaming or into any of the xbox systems um i wonder what price point it would be I, I, it all really depends because we all kind of thought very like fire stick ish where we'd go right into the hdmi and everything i think it'll probably be slightly more than that but even the fire stick has to have a power source so it really depends how that really works and it, it, you know the fire stick streams completely um that has very very little download ability i just wonder how much more the xbox because you do need some basic <laughs> to be able to stream get into the launcher get into all that little fun stuff so i, I wonder i'm technology wise and tech wise i'm interested in what's in it but besides that probably not something i'd be dying to get unless the price point's like really 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 friendly then maybe i would keep it in you know maybe in my bedroom right now just on the occasion when i want to Sometimes I do want to just jump into the Halo Infinite store to look at what's going on. Um, that game is on a crutch anyway. So I, some, sometimes, sometimes I do want to just dive into a game really quick to see what's been going on. And maybe there's a, a charm in just being always able to access that in any room. But at the same time, if I was dying for that, I mean, the Series S is... You can get the Series S bundled with, like, three games for, like, 250 now. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's wild, so... I mean, unless this device comes out for significantly under a hundred, then it would be kind of uh, tempting. But besides that, I, I'm excited for what it could do to bring more people into the ecosystem. Yeah, you would imagine it has to be below a hundred, just because it's not actually processing anything. Yeah, like, I mean, exactly. like it, it'll have some storage on it, yeah, for the apps and for the UI and all that stuff. But it's actually it's not running anything. Um, it, it's connecting to servers, so you would imagine like there's no disk drive. Uh, it's not actually, you know, processing anything. So it would. I'd be surprised. You know, it, it's just having that Xbox name. This is official Xbox hardware. So there's going to be some degree of a markup there. But I'd be like anything above fifty for me. You're pushing it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, five again, right now, unless it. it's doing something else that we don't know about. Like I was talking mm -hmm. about. Like if if they somehow figured out something where it's like, yeah, if you stream through this device, it's a fundamentally better experience than streaming through anything else. Then I guess there's going to be some tech in there that justifies a, a slightly higher price point. But anything above a hundred, I think, kind of defeats the purpose of having this in the first place. Because then, yeah, again, we're we're talking about now you're you're itching up into like actual Xbox territory, uh, where you can you can buy just a physical device that you'll also be able to stream on, but you can also you know load discs into and do whatever you want into. So. Um, you know, from what I understand, this the, this streaming device isn't a console in the traditional sense, so shouldn't have traditional console pricing mm -hmm. tactics, if that makes sense. No. Um, it, it should be treated, in my opinion, as an accessory uh, to the TV or whatever you have. I have little uh, things that are sent over from the cable company that will allow you to stream different things and access different things with your modem and stuff like that. I think it has to be in that world, you know what I mean? To uh, just complement your TV, your media center, not something necessarily to be in place of a console just because it's not really doing too much. Uh, but yeah, that's just kind of how I'm, I'm feeling with it. Yeah, see, I mean, I'm looking now at, a few, you know, Chrome is about 60 bucks. Amazon, the newest Amazon one, you get 60 bucks, you can get cheaper ones for that. Yeah. The only one that you even hit that 100 area <clears throat> is the Apple TV, and Apple overprices everything, so. Yeah, that's the Apple tax, so. <laughs> yeah, I w so. so I think it's safe to say we're looking 60? at between 50 and 70, probably. Yeah, that's what I'm going to, that's what I would be guessing. I'd for. hope. <laughs> um, unless, again, they probably, the only way I can, there would probably be two SKUs. Maybe they bundle it with an Xbox control. Then I can see that, and that'd be fine. Oh yeah. Then I can understand that. But even then, they probably give you a month free of Game Pass, or you know, they would sweeten the deal because, in that sense, Xbox is pretty good. Yeah, Stadia and Luna did the exact same thing. Uh, what, which is a streaming device, a controller, and a, like a, a little card or a subscription thing, um, with it. So I'm assuming, yeah, you'll see that little bundle. And, and all that. Uh, do you know the MSRP on just your a standard Xbox controller? Because I know a DualSense can be upwards of, what, 70, 60, 70? De de depending on the color, uh, they usually launch either 60, 65, or 70. Yeah, so I think altogether, probably a 99, 99 type situation wouldn't be, wouldn't yeah. be a bad idea. 
anything above that, I still think it, it's a bit much, to be honest with you. Uh, going, going, you know, you, you start t- touching, you know, 115, 125. It's like, bruh, I don't know. Yeah. Throw a game in there or something. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to see. I, I, that's where I wonder where they can go. For sure. <clears throat> All right, moving from uh, one mystery to another, uh, the new Kojima game. Uh, so, <clears throat> Kojima Productions is working on a new project with Xbox Game Studio. This was all announced uh, a while back at the Bethesda Game Showcase. Um, Kojima's next game is still something of a mystery, however. He and Microsoft only announced plans to collaborate on a new game, did not reveal a title, gameplay, or anything of the project. Kojima described the project as a completely new game and one that Kojima himself has always wanted to make and it sounds like Kojima Productions new game will utilize Microsoft's cloud gaming technology for whatever it is that Kojima wants to use it for. Um, Quote, there is a game I've always wanted to make, uh, Kojima said in a translated remarks. It's a very new is a very completely new game that no one has ever seen or experienced before. I've waited very long for the day when I could finally start to create it. When Microsoft's Cutting edge cloud technology and the change in the industry's trend, it has now become possible to challenge myself to make this never before seen concept. It may take some time, but I'm looking forward to teaming up with Xbox Game Studios in hopes to bring you some exciting news in the future. Um, obviously, it's small, I, I don't know if it's a follow up, but uh, he's obviously been teasing this game on his Twitter as he does. You know, at TGS, he always kept putting up the Who Am I? Um, and we now know that it is um, Miss Fanning that's going to be there. Uh, L, right? How was uh, her first name? Oh, yeah, L right Fanning, here. yeah. L, L Fanning. Um, then he put Pax is the where am I? And so that's starting to tease that. So looks like he's going to pretty much work up to uh, the next the next probably place. Knowing him and uh, Jeff Keighley, that's going to obviously be probably where we get even more information. What, now, Game Awards? Yeah, at the Game Awards, yep. most likely. I mean, he's been at every Game Awards for the last couple yeah, of years, so it wouldn't be a surprise that he'd be there. Um, so, yeah, again, it's it's weird because he, we don't have anything else besides, I mean, we had just a silhouette of a blonde woman. Now we have this, we uh, the full facing of Elle Fanning. Um, you know, we've seen, I don't think we've seen any behind the scenes. I think we saw her at a uh, mocap studio or something like that. Nothing else is really con- is shown, so... Is this the leaked overdose stuff that came out a while ago? Um, would be interesting because that stuff all led to being PlayStation, exclu- at least on PlayStation. We don't know if it's a strict ex- uh, PlayStation exclusive, uh, but we don't. Know, we do know that that project was leaked with uh, Margaret Qualley, which was from Death Stranding. Um, so there's a lot of mystery, uh, per the usual, for <laughs> Mr. Kojima. Uh, there is a sort of mystery of, is this the same project as the Xbox project? Is the Xbox project a separate project? Because the way this seems may be more of a traditional game, which is okay, which is more than okay with me. Um, I, it is interesting to see what Kojima means. He is very purpose of the way he talks sometimes and how mystery he is. I mean... Didn't he make a Game Boy Advance game that you need to play in the sun, uh, which was oh yeah, very redundant if you've played Game Boy Advance in the sun. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I he he does take that non traditional route sometimes. I I keep trying to rack my brain about it, but he he's just a hard guy, especially now listening to his podcast. Um, though those have been more thoughts on like. Uh, nope and everything like that um, but the, just to see the way he thinks and sees things I have no idea what he could do specifically that would s- capitalize so much on like streaming but obviously with with him I'm, I've become more a fan of him now uh, than maybe before I was I've always liked Metal Gear but I think seeing who he is as a person seeing uh, on his taste of movies and taking a chance on making a game that is literally just uh management of equipment which is something i usually hate in video games and that's one of my favorite games ever really uh in death stranding i've become a big fan so i'm i'm pretty much on board with whatever vision he thinks he can pull off uh so that's really exciting um what do you think what is, what's your sort of uh thoughts on on this yeah no it, it's it's pretty trippy stuff and it, that's the problem with kojima where it's like he's one of the few people that i feel like 
you know, it, it's just unbelievably difficult to even try to predict what he could possibly, one thing, be talking about and second off be working on. Um, just because, I mean, I, I remember getting those early um, looks into Death Stranding and all the guesses that went out there. And then we finally get the game and it's like, there's no way any of us could have predicted this. This uh, mm-hmm. Amazon courier delivery post-apocalyptic smoke demon you know game like it's just Mm -hmm. it's just such a far departure from what any of us uh could have done and yeah it's a fundamentally different experience from anything that's ever been created you know you you put that down on paper your average person's like what the hell are you talking about no that that that's not gonna work and then he you release the game and it's like wow like he actually pulled it off like i i don't you you'll finish the game and it's like i don't even know what to think about this like like i loved it but I, i i don't i've never played anything like this before and so that's kind of where i'm at about it where it's like what kojima and cloud streaming means like i i don't know what that looks like um you know the advantage i think of of cloud gaming is is that kind of uh the fact that you're accessing a server so maybe there's an an aspect of this game that's going to be dynamic and ever-changing um maybe there's a component of that that goes farther into the um multiplayer aspects he's always he's always had kind of a interesting relationship with the the uh, online component where it's never a traditional like i'm running next to somebody and more so like kind of this collaborative social type thing uh maybe it's an evolution on that but uh, according to him this is a game he's wanted to make for a while um so i'm excited to see what that what this type kind of technology allows him to vision uh, kind of realize uh and and what that tech kind of brings to the forefront but yeah, I'm, I'm 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 definitely sold on it. But I'd be lying if I said that I had any even inkling of where I think this game could even be. Like I have no clue, yeah. uh, and I'm not gonna even try to guess. And the more I hear him speak, the more confused I get. And where I'm just like, I don't know, I don't know what he's talking about because he's the type of guy who's like, you know, I'm very inspired by these three things, and then it's like three separate things that don't even have one percent connection to one another. And so I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, he's definitely a guy who I think um, his mind, you know, you know, people I think throw around the word like like genius a lot and stuff like that. And I, I think he's the perfect example of a guy who uh, is like a renaissance man in terms of like he loves taking in all these different types of media of different genres and stuff like that. And his mind, ha- his mind is like a blender that I think can kind of like take all these things and blend them around so they're unrecognizable and spits out something else this smoothie this hodgepodge of just craziness where he's like yeah you you see this is this from that and that from this and this is where i took inspiration from and it's like my brain doesn't have the neurons to make the connections that he does like i just don't i just don't have it so i'm excited to see from it um but it's one of those things where it's like i'll take what he gives me whenever that is i don't know what it's going to look like i don't know when it's going to be or why it's going to be um but i i know phil spencer is loving this he he has to love the fact that this guy is finally on the xbox side uh and the, the you know he has this unique advantage where he'll go with these companies and they will go all in on him with the full knowledge that at no point is he going to be a, f- a first person developer for them like he's going to bounce around i wouldn't be surprised if in five years next thing you know you see him and miyamoto next to each other i honestly don't think that's a far stretch like where you know he, he bounces around and people take him when they can get him uh and so he's in with xbox right now and i think that's really really sick but what i love is this kind of free agent ability of his to kind of pop up and he's with jeff Keeley, and then he's got phil spencer loving him and not too long ago playstation was all in on him and i'm sure at some point you're gonna see him right next to you know god knows what you know nintendo maybe next to sega at some point and he's di- directing the next sonic game i don't know what he's gonna be doing next but uh i'm, I'm all in on it yeah same here same here I'm, i've become such a fan and just willing to take that risk because you don't know what you end up with exactly so lastly is uh quite a controversial one uh that has kind of broke i I just learned about it yesterday i I think this has been stewing for a little bit now uh and apparently there's a there's a pretty significant beef between the bayonetta development team and uh the former lead actress so let's get into it bayonetta voice actress our act, yeah, actress uh, Helena Taylor has shared that she did not reprise the role for Bayonetta 3 as she was only 
offered $4,000 to do so. Furthermore, she asked Lan to boycott the game and donate to charity instead. So Taylor took to Twitter to share a few videos of her uh, speaking to a camera to share her side of the story following the announcement that Mass Effect's Jennifer Hale, she plays Shepard for anybody who didn't know, uh, would be replacing her in Bayonetta 3. Taylor has voiced the character since the original game and could not stay silent about how she was treated. Uh, the Bayonetta franchise has made an approximate 40, $450 million, and that's not including merchandising. Uh, Taylor began, as an actor, I trained for a total of seven and a half years, three years into the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, Lambda, with voice, co of voice coach Barbara Berkeley, and four and a half years with the legendary Larry Moss in Los Angeles, and what did they think that was worth, what did they offer to pay me, the final offer to do the whole game as a bio flat rate is $4,000. USD. For all you who don't know, uh, a bio flat rate basically means that she's probably not going to get any royalties on the back end. It's kind of like 4000 up front, you do the work, and then that's kind of the end of it. She doesn't have any uh, ownership or royalties or back end that she would get. Um, see the first th uh, the three videos on Twitter for the rest of her statement. And uh, the Hideki Kamiya, the guy who actually you know directs these games, uh, over there at Platinum has since responded to these allegations with a short tweet saying sad and deplorable about the attitude of untruth That is all I will tell now by the way beware of my rules um, Obviously that's a bit cryptic in and of itself. I will really quick offer a little insight there uh, I combed through that tweet a million times trying to understand exactly what he's saying I could only guess uh, this seems like a classic kind of like Google Translate or maybe broken English type situation but uh, basically from what I can garner from this is maybe he's saying like yeah that like it's sad that she's like lying about this and he can't speak much about it beware of my rules tells me maybe he's saying like she's like in violation of NDA or contract or something like that like that that's the only thing I can guess is that maybe he's saying that she's in breach or something so like that there might be a legal follow-up of this i don't know uh that's speculation on my end but yeah that's pretty crazy four thousand you know flat out uh for an accomplished voice actress to do an entire game is nuts uh because again that sometimes takes months and months and months of work and so uh, as an accomplished voice actress to do four thousand uh, of you know several months of work you know like we're, we're talking about significantly low money i mean that that's not gonna really cover much at all especially for somebody who maybe is living in la or whatever um you know that's that's pretty crazy uh what did you think about that yeah um i was actually a little torn because um some of the stuff i didn't know i i did not realize that when i, w I wasn't aware of the voice actress even not being in bayonetta 3 that was yeah i didn't know either i did not know from the few clips of voices i heard in the trailer it sounded like it just sounded like Bayonetta to me. Um, yeah. So I, I was completely unaware. So I, I, I am glad that she brought this to light because if I didn't, and I'm someone who pretty on top of gaming news stories, even if it's not something I always dis you know, discuss, I usually see everything. Um, so this is something that really caught me off guard when she started posting about this. Um, <clears throat> so one, it is very disrespectful. I mean, <clears throat> $4,000, that, that will cover what, maybe a month of her mortgage? If I don't know where she lives, but yeah, in this day and age, that's what one month rent for a whole game you know for, for what we believe is capping off a trilogy which does sell a lot and it's exclusive to nintendo um it's 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 nuts and i think it's very disrespectful for that um i do think there may be more here and this is not to choose sides on platinum or or mr uh, camilla um she she's replaced with jennifer hale who is part of the voice actor union she's not doing this for four thousand dollars no, no, yeah, no, no way no way someone who has the reputation that she has um um there's just there's just no way so i know i that's where i get that's where i start getting confused and, and don't understand what is truly happening because it, it doesn't make sense in, in many ways and i tried to do some digging to see if there was something that i had missed um uh, because it just it all really, really didn't make sense. Um, I mean, this is... I mean, Jennifer Hale, great voice. Uh, from Mass Effect to a huge run on Cartoon Network shows. And she's just high, high esteemed. Again, like I said, big. she's a big pushing voice. You know, uh, no pun intended, for the 
voice acting union so it's very very confusing in that aspect um and i wonder if she was even aware of the drama um and i think that's where we start getting that beware of my rules thing because uh I, I, I don't know if these two even know each other personally, but I from the the interviews I've seen and the way I've seen Jennifer Hill uh, talk about, you know, the respect that voice actors deserve and and even sometimes going as much as just being called actors and all that stuff, I feel like if maybe she knew, she may have not even taken the role. So that's where I get, like, there's got to be some sort of confusion because this is not a huge... Nintendo's the, the big publisher and stuff like that, but Platinum Games has been on a, on a down, like... Uh, a huge sort of suffering uh we've seen constant game cancellations we saw there was that whole little small rumor that they were like begging xbox to bring back uh that dragon game that they got canceled oh um, the scale bound or whatever the scale bound exactly um that you know apparently microsoft was the one that was not happy with that project um so there's there is a lot of mystery and that's where it's like and i know mr Camille doesn't truly speak for everyone at plan i'm not saying everyone at plan is bad um, but this does put a weird sort of, like, ick about it. Like, what do you do now? Like, the game comes out in a week. Uh, there have been a lot of people, and I've seen it on, on you know, with their Twitter uh, completely refunding uh, Bayonetta 3 and and everything like that. So there is, like, this weird sense, like, man, do you support the game? There's some people who can't can get a refund at all. Uh, why did... If... If speaking out now is is breaking some sort of NDA, uh, why didn't she just speak earlier? Yeah, and break it because uh, it is it's because the game's gonna be releasing this week regardless. I in a perfect world, in a perfect world they would have paid her what she owed, was owed, but it 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 does just leave this weird controversy, and we're no strangers to controversy in in this video game era, but seeing it happen so abruptly. Uh, and, and she's voiced Bayonetta for years now. The, well, the original Bayonetta was what, 2006, six, seven? Uh, like yeah, because it's like PS3. Yeah, so that's you know she's did that one. She, I know she, I believe she redid some lines for the remastered version. I believe she did it for both Smash Brothers. I believe it was all the original actor Helena. Um, so it is just like weird. It's weird. Like now, now is when you're gonna try to cheap shot them. Um, when you have the money of Nintendo publishing, um, and I know that is all legal stuff that gets intertwined. Do they not have much to do with that? Or are they just literally the way I understand Nintendo just is doing the publishing because we saw Bayonetta years ago and then heard nothing about it for so long. So I wonder, I, I'd be surprised if right before launch something happens and the game is stopped or held or whatever it is. Um, if they do see a significant unpre-order cancellation, um, but yeah, this just caught me so off guard though, because it's just, we haven't heard much about specific situations like this. Um, we do always hear, you know, Trey Baker and, and Jennifer Hale and, you know, like Nolan North speaking of like why they believe and believe in the unionization, um, of, of this career. Um, and then, then you, but you never really hear too much of like specifics. So when you see such a high case one. It is kind of shocking. Like, I was I was taken back. I was taken back. I'll be honest. Yeah, it's it, it's a tough one because at this point, it's a little bit of a he said she said type of situation where she's like they offered me four thousand. Camille's like that's basically lies. But the problem is from Platinum side, she gave a very in depth you know four a uh, three part video of exact mm-hmm. her exact experience. And we got a cryptic tweet from the Platinum side. I need more from Platinum, to be honest, from you. I need a statement. I need a, a straight refutation because now we're in a weird place where, yeah, she's calling for an outright boycott, which is another interesting thing where it's like we've seen, uh, you know, various creatives disgruntled with a specific company or a project or whatever. And, you know, sometimes they're just like, you know, maybe second guess your support of this or support the you know donate to this cause she's calling for an outright boycott so it's pretty flat out um which is 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 pretty crazy because yeah you know as someone personally who i always will stand on the side of the creator that i have to take that seriously but at the same time you know like uh one thing there's a lot of people who lent their uh creativity and and worked really hard on this video game and so like should contractual negotiations that went bad 
make the rest of the team suffer? I don't know. That's, I think, something worth analyzing. You know, there's lots of developers that worked really hard on this game that, you know, their careers are impacted by people not supporting this game as well. Should they be impacted because, you know, contract negotiations weren't fair for a voice actor? I don't know. It's worth looking into. But I also really need to know uh, what happened with that. You know, like, was she really offered just $4,000? Was there a miscommunication there? Did formal negotiations actually ever begin? I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, because, yeah, 4000 is just insane. Like, if that actually happened, then, yeah, like, you know, I can't in good faith support this project. I mean, that just disrespect creators like that that are that tenured into their career. Um, but to a certain extent, you know, like, I, I have a hard time just thinking that, you know, she just freestyled this, you know, out of nowhere, where it's just like, you know, we've seen situations like, let's say, let's take David Hayter, for example, with uh, MGS5, who's kind of screwed over for a bit. For some reason, they didn't want to include him uh, in, in MGS5, and so they recast him uh, as, with what well, I believe it was like Kiefer Sutherland um, that replaced him. Uh, and so we've seen situations where there's like replace, and David Hayter was not happy about that. Um, and so that happens where, like, you know, you have a thing. I've seen some people suggest, and I don't, I'm not saying this is the case at all, but some people are just suggesting that this is a disgruntled voice actress that is kind of throwing anything out there to screw over the game. I have a hard time believing that. Uh, this is not a rookie voice actress. This is somebody who's been established, who's worked with them theoretically for a, a long time, who probably has a lot of friends on that team. Um, and it, I just have a hard time believing that she just come out of nowhere, throw the four thousand dollars. Someone I think at some point was probably offered that, and uh, things. I just wonder if that was a formal offer or that was the going rate at the time, and you know she was insulted by that number. Something happened there, but that's why it's important for us to hear from Platinum. Like what what happened here? I want to hear from the company side, other than a weird cryptic tweet of basically Camille saying that he's gonna you know throw the hammer down. Um, basically is what it sounds like. I think we need a little bit more of that uh, than that. So I think this is an evolving story. Right now the game is set to come out, what, the 28th, I believe. Uh, so I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks they say something that can maybe inform my decision a little bit because I'm super conflicted right now on what to do. I was really, really anticipating playing this game, but I don't want to support a game that's screwing over the creatives also. So um, yeah, I'm hoping we can get a little bit more information ideally a resolution of some sort uh and i don't know what that looks like you know the game's already made so it's not like they're gonna i i don't necessarily want them to i mean jennifer hale's done her job already so it's not like they're gonna fire her and then replace her with uh helena taylor not that i even want that because jennifer hale is an incredible voice actress in her own right as well um but hopefully you know they can come to some kind of resolution to explain and shed a little light of what happened there you know, ideally, maybe like an apology being like, you know, this slipped through the cracks. It wasn't supposed to be that low of an offer. This, this, and this happened. We are apologize. We look forward to maybe working with her in the future, blah, blah, blah. And then there we go. That would be my ideal situation. But only time will tell what happened. But I'm sure we will hear from Platinum if this gains any degree of traction. That's another thing is that uh, this is big in the games industry talking right now. You have to keep in mind a overwhelming amount of people who will play Bayonetta on the Nintendo Switch do not know this story is happening. That's just the nature of the games industry. Um, most players don't go on IGN or GameSpot every day. That's just a fact. Um, so if this gains any real traction, I think you're going to hear from Platinum. But there's a good chance that this never spills outside of that. You know, this is not hidden NBC. This is not hidden ABC so uh, there's there's a chance that if this if they don't see sufficient cancellations and it's just a lot of people talking a lot and, and and that's ultimately is you have to hit the bottom line if it doesn't hit the bottom line they might not say nothing they'll just let it pass time will pass the game will come out the reviews will be what it is and you know the world keeps turning uh, and and so we'll kind of see uh, but I'm gonna keep a close eye onto this story because I think it's very uh, interesting because it kind of goes hand in hand with all that union talk and stuff like that and yeah. you know if this played out the way that Helena Taylor said it did which I don't have any reason to doubt that it did uh, this is the exact reason why I feel like the voice actors were so militant and they're wanting to to unionize this is why the kind of collective bargaining and the having a little bit of uh, leverage on their side helps where you don't get these insane lowball offers you know what I mean because because you have to play ball with a larger entity. You have to treat the 
the actors uh, with kind of a uniform fairness. Uh, and, and so that, that I think is why, you know, you'll see the Troy Bakers and the Nolan Norths and all of them kind of riding so hard for it. Because I'm sure if this is true, which I believe it to be, uh, I'm sure Troy Baker could probably reach into the vaults with a couple of situations where he probably was in this exact same situation and probably had yeah, to walk away sure. from a project or two uh, for getting an insane offer. So I, I don't think this is a one off. I think this probably happens a lot. Uh, unfortunately and just a lot of voice actors and actresses don't go out of their way to publicize that Uh, maybe for contractual reasons maybe because it's probably not looked at the best you know a lot of companies probably I think Helena Taylor did a very brave thing here because I think this is this is going to cost her (laughs) Uh, and I'm sure she knows that that I think there's going to be a lot of companies I think there's a good chance that yeah she'll never work with Planum again outside of the money thing because she publicized this and so i think to some degree it was a brave thing to do because again it publicized the larger issues and and gave it gave people like us a lot of insight into the goings on behind the scenes uh but that's gonna that's gonna have severe ramifications for her and i hope it's not to the point where she doesn't work again but there is such a thing as like blackballing in the entertainment industry and uh, this is the exact kind of action that leads to that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I really do wish her the best, and I hope we can get a little bit more information. And if they really did screw her up, over, um, you know, I think that's going to have ramifications for the team uh, and, and whoever was responsible for um, negotiating such a bad deal or offering such a bad uh, offer to her. And, you know, I hope they, they kind of reap what they sow, I guess, for that kind of action. No, absolutely. Yeah, we'll have to find. You know, I I went, I went two years without playing these Bayonetta series, so I can go easily. And I got plenty to play this year. Um, I have no problem, you know, putting my money where my mouth is. So I have no problem not supporting this game. Uh, wait to buy it, whatever, secondhand used, or I, I don't support emulation. But uh, <laughs> I mean, we all know what Steam. I, I don't know if you saw this. Uh, not to get off the rails, but Steam. Uh, put up a trailer for Steam Deck and they the user the thing they did put this in the Switch <laughs> yeah um, yeah that was hilarious obviously that was and I'm not condoning that but I'm just saying if if you know I know what it is to have your work not even be appreciated for you know I'm of course blue collar yeah. worker um so that's just it is just very disrespectful so I have no problem standing with her if it all comes to true that this is exactly how it all played out. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, and this is messed up to admit, but I mean, I think to a certain extent, um, it also depends also about, like, your relationship with the franchise and how you're able to react. You know, like, personally, I have a pretty hard stance where I do not rock with Activision, and so I don't really play their games uh, like that. And if I do play an Activision game, I don't play the kind of uh, live service versions. I just buy them secondhand, and I play them as I play them. That, and, and that's kind of my approach to it. Um it, but it's easy because I didn't play a lot of Activision games. So if I need to drop Bayonetta, okay. You know, I, I'm at, if this was like God of War, for example, I think you and I are in a really tough spot at that point um, to, to boycott. So I think it kind of helps a little bit that, you know, I love Bayonetta. Don't get it twisted. But if I need to hold off for a bit until I can figure out what the hell's going on, I mean, I'm, I'm not losing sleep over that. But, uh, yeah, I, I really do hope that they kind of sort that out and – uh, ultimately, I think what, however the story plays out, that I think that there is a um, overall benefit, a net benefit to this, which is just them talking about compensating voice actors and creatives in general fairly in this industry, which I think is a, overall a good conversation to have. Uh, however, this situation specifically uh, plays out. You know, overall, I think it's a good conversation. You had a lot of years of exploitation and weird nasty things going on uh and and i think you know that the fact that i think the average consumer is a little bit more conscious about those issues i think is a great thing and then the more conscious that they become the ultimately the better it's going to be for everyone involved the game from the creators to the directors to the voice actors to to the art directors i think it, it everybody improves when um the, a little bit more pay transparency kind of happens i think no, absolutely, absolutely. 
All right, so that was the show. Big one, four stories this week, really good. And uh, I'm excited about the next episode because at that point we're heading into the fall, which is going to have a crap ton of brand new games. We're headed towards what we got Bayonetta, we got Gotham Knights, we got God of War right around the corner. Pokemon, Sonic, I mean, you name it, a lot of things are coming out, and uh, it's good because it's been kind of quiet for a bit, so finally we're going to get a little, and I, and I feel like a little bit like uh, Saints Row and Last of Us kind of opened that up, uh, and now we're headed towards a really heavy point, uh, headed towards the holidays, so I'm really excited to talk about all these new games as they come out. So, that was the Neo Vintage Podcast, I'm Jabril, and I'm here with... Steve, hope you guys enjoyed. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye.